Have you tried intermittent fasting? I know you've heard about it. It's hard not to hear about it. Is it the right step for you? And really, what is it? Or if we're not really talking about intermittent fasting, but we're talking about clean, clean eating, clean living, clean lifestyle, how does intermittent fasting fit into that? We're unpacking all of it today. And I'm in love because my guest has a Southern accent. So, you know, (laughs) I'm going to enjoy it and I'm just bringing you along for the ride. So my guest today is best-selling author of multiple books on the topic of intermittent fasting, but her newest book is really about something bigger and she's one of us. (laughs) So she's legally welcome to join the Flipping 50 community and she gets us. So let's dive in to this episode. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns. Most of all, though, hope to inspire you by sharing what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset, often about what you eat and how to move so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. Today's episode is sponsored by my signature course, the After 50 Fitness Formula for Women. That course is the one for you if you are a do-it-yourself girl. You kind of like to do things in the convenience of your at-home and on your own time. No time limit because you've got access to everything for a year, although I will prompt you from week to week with certain content that'll tease you and get you interested in jumping right back into those modules so that you get the most out of it and then you always have that to come back to and refer to. I will put the link to that in the show notes along with a juicy podcast listener only special. All right, here we go. My guest today is Jen Stevens. She's the author of the New York Times and USA Today bestseller, Fast, Feast, Repeat, and Delay, Don't Deny, Living an Intermittent Fasting Lifestyle, an Amazon number one bestseller in the weight loss category, as well as Cleanish, Eat Mostly, Clean, Live Mainly, Clean, and Unlock Your Body's Natural Ability to self clean. And that is out in 2022. Jen has lived the intermittent fasting lifestyle since 2014, losing over 80 pounds. She's the host of three top ranked podcasts, Intermittent Fasting Stories, the Intermittent Fasting Podcast with Melanie Avalon, and the Life Lessons Podcast with Sherry Bullock. So don't forget, Jen's new book is out early in 2022. So no matter when you're listening to this, you could pre-order or you can get your grubby little hands clean and grab this book. You can be cleanish. (laughs) See what I did there? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) January 4th is when it officially drops. So So depending on when this episode comes out, you can either pre-order or go ahead and get it. Love it. And Jen, you spend your time between Augusta, Georgia and Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where she lives with her husband and her three cats. (laughs) Jen is also a mother of two adult sons, and she's thankful every day for the intermittent fasting lifestyle that makes her life easier. Jen, thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. This is a topic that I'm going to be totally transparent here. So I have a love-hate relationship with intermittent fasting. Love-hate given love that it's it's absolutely uh, everything that it says it will be for longevity, for health purposes. And yet for some women, I think there's a struggle here and a flirt with eating disorders and calorie restriction and, and dancing that dance can be tricky. So for that reason, listener, I want you to listen to this, you know, as you need to and and hear what you need to. And so, Jen, maybe we should start with that. So, I mean, that's you, a great place to you start. Readily acknowledge, you know, that that of course that's a concern. So, talk a little bit about 
your own personal experience. You know, I want to first say the the eating disorders. I just want to get that elephant right out there. Mm-hmm. You know, fasting is a tool that people with eating disorders may use, but there are also a lot of other tools that people with eating disorders may use. And that doesn't mean that those tools cause the eating disorder or are disordered themselves. It's just misuse of the tools that really become a problem. So if anyone's been diagnosed with an eating disorder, I would re- work with a counselor, um, you know, to, you know, if you're interested in doing intermittent fasting, you know, maybe the counselor can find a way for you to do it safely. Um, we've actually had recovered um, people in our community who have had eating disorders and they actually find finally relief and sanity for the first time, you know, from things from binge eating behaviors to over restriction, that sort of thing. So it's not that you absolutely can't. I would just proceed with caution. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what's the difference? Why is intermittent fasting, you know, for some women a problem and for other women it is not? And I think it goes back to let's think about, first of all, our overall diet history. We've probably, most of us as women, come to a point in our life where we realized it was feminine to eat less food, right? You know, you see the joke like, oh, if you're on a date, you shouldn't order, you know, eat eat like a bird, eat a little salad. And so we've we've connected femininity with eating small amounts, certain foods, girls eat salad, you know what I mean? And we've also, you know, been conditioned to follow low calorie diets, count your calories or count your carbs or count your fat grams and restrict, restrict, restrict. Because we were taught that the only way to lose weight is to eat less and move more. So we got good at that. We're we're good learners. We learned that was how to do it. So we started doing it. Many of us started doing it in high school, even earlier. You know, I, I have in my um, intermittent fasting stories podcast, I talked to you know lots and lots of people. We've you know, gosh, two hundred by now that I've talked to, and um, some people report their mom sent them to weight loss, like to Weight Watchers in in middle school or something. So we've had all those years of learning to eat like a bird. So if you begin doing intermittent fasting and approach your eating window as I'm going to diet in my eating window. That is really a recipe for over-restriction. And women's bodies do not do well with over-restriction. I mean, men's bodies don't do great with it either, but women are more hormonally sensitive to the over-restriction than men are. So we just have to be really careful that we do not approach intermittent fasting as also something that you do with really restrictive eating inside your eating window. You know, I want you to notice that my book was called Fast Feast Repeat not fast, eat like a bird in your diet meals, and then repeat. So that's just a really important thing to keep in mind. You know, I've been doing it since 2014. Um, I'm now 52. So y'all can do the math and figure out how old I was when I started. I (laughs) was not (laughs) menopausal yet. I was premenopausal. I was having, you know, all the good premenopausal fun before I started intermittent fasting. Then I started intermittent fasting, started going through menopause, um, at the age of 50. So I'm, I'm two years into that now um, and officially on the other side. But I really think intermittent fasting helped me sail through it. But it was the first time in my life when I really adjusted to an intermittent fasting lifestyle, it was the first time in my life that I feel like I lost the obsessive thoughts about food and the restrict, restrictive thinking. It's almost like, you know, all those years, the decades where I was constantly looking for the right diet, trying to lose the weight when I was obese, when I was, you know, 80 pounds heavier than I am now, that felt very disordered. You know, for the first time now, like I said, I'm 52. I'm wearing, you know, the same jeans that I fit into in 2015 when I hit my goal weight and my weight doesn't go up and down. I don't yo-yo. I'm not looking for a new diet. I eat well. I well I'm well nourished. This feels like the least um obsessive thing that I can do. It certainly it's the least disordered I've ever felt around food in my entire life, really. So really, I love hearing that because that's kind of the opposite that someone might suspect. That it's really were, the opposite right? of what you, you know how George mm-hmm. Costanza has that period in Seinfeld where he does the opposite of everything. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like intermittent fasting. You know, there's a saying about it. Um, I didn't make this up, but I love it. Intermittent fasting is hard in contemplation, but easy in execution. I actually said it backwards because the first part you're, I was supposed to say, dieting is easy in contemplation and hard in execution. 
So, you know, any diet we've ever started, we're like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm going to do it. It's going to be great. Then we start it and it gets harder and harder and harder. And then we fall off the wagon and we crash and burn and we don't want to do it anymore. Intermittent fasting is the opposite. You think it's going to be hard. You're like, oh, I just don't know. Then you start doing it. Once your body adapts, once you're metabolically flexible, you're fat adapted, you've gotten into the groove, it actually is easier and easier. And it just, you feel better and better. I love that analogy. So good. Okay. So you were way ahead of the curve. I, I mean, was. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't sexy. It wasn't trending eight years ago. How did you ever stumble on intermittent fasting and begin it? Well, you know, I actually found it even earlier than that because like 2009 is when I first started dabbling in it. There, you know, I was at the point, I was so desperate. I mean, I have a PhD. Well, actually, it's an ed. I don't know why it's a PhD. Can we cut that little part out? It's not a, not edit that little. Let me say that again. I have a doctorate in gifted education. I have a master's degree in science education. I am not, you know, an uneducated person, but I couldn't figure out dieting. I couldn't figure out how to control my weight. I was yo-yoing up and down. So I literally read everything. You know, if somebody had a diet plan, I was going to read it. I was going to try it. And so I um, I went through, you know, Brad Pilon early days. He had something called Eat, Stop, Eat. Dr. Burt Hearing had something. It was free. You could get it on his website called the Fast Five Diet and Weight Loss. It was a five-hour eating window program, 19 hours of fasting, five-hour eating. I read, um, you know, stuff about the alternate day diet. There was one um, Dr. Johnson's up day, down day diet or something. And so I read them all and I would try them, but I never gave them enough time from 2009 to 2014. I would do them. I would dabble for a couple of days and I would quit. Then a week later I might have another, it just, it never worked because I never let my body adapt. So in 2014, when I was 80 pounds overweight, obese, needed to lose the weight, I was desperate. I was like, you know, intermittent fasting, I'm just going to make it work this time. And for the first time, I didn't quit. I just quit quitting. I let my body adjust and then it got easier. And then, you know, I lost the weight and it became a lifestyle. So there wasn't a lot out there though in 2014. You know, those books that I mentioned before, Michael Mosley had some stuff like 5-2 was out. Um, Krista Verde with her every other day diet, which is an alternate day fasting approach. Um, there really wasn't a lot out there. So we were kind of all, you know, we were, I was in Facebook groups where we were kind of all supporting each other, but we all really thought in those early days of 2014, 2015, we thought that intermittent fasting only worked because it was a way to eat fewer calories. We didn't understand the hormonal benefits, the longevity benefits. We didn't understand any of that. We're like, well, we're eating fewer calories because it's in a five hour window. That's why it works. And then 2016, the Obesity Code came out, Dr. Jason Fung's book. Have you read that one? Yes. And it really, we were like, oh, it's more than just you're eating fewer calories. That's where I really learned about insulin and how high levels of circulating insulin um, keep us from tapping into our fat stores. And then it all just really started making sense. So I want you to, we, we unpacked a lot of things right there. So hang we on. Did. So for listeners who may have heard this before, but I would love to unpack several different ways. I mean, I talk about it as if there's a continuum of fasting. First of all, not very many people don't snack between meals and go from dinner to breakfast, or at least right. 12 hours or more fasting. And that's a good place to start, people. But let's unpack the rest. So like five and two and eight and 16 and alternate <laughs> day. I mean, there's just so, so many, many ways. puzzle pieces. And yeah. then I'd love to know what do you like and or how do you recommend people find the one that works for them? Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, in my book, Fast, Feast, Repeat, I, ha I talk about all of the approaches, like in an, the ins and outs of all of them and how to design an approach that works for you, whether you like the eating window approach, um, which is what most people start off with. And really probably most people settle into the eating window approach, also known as time-restricted eating. Or if you want to dabble with some um, alternate daily fasting, there's pure alternate daily fasting where you 
eat a day, fast a day, eat a day, fast a day. But there's variations of that, like four, three with you know, four up days, three down days, and five, two is just like that, five up days, two um, down days. Or you can have a hybrid approach, which a lot of people do. Like, okay. for example, rudely interrupting okay, you. Please do. Up days, down days. Right. So yep. Higher yep. calories, lower calories. Yes. Okay. In the in the alternate daily fasting research, they started off, um, Krista Verde did a great deal of this research. Um, and they had what they called down days, where they were eating 500 calories a day. And then up days, which are the, the following days, after your down day, you have an up day where you have unrestricted eating. So that's down day, up day. But there's also a variation where the down day is a full fast, like you might do a 36-hour fast. So she's also done research on that. So she's done research on the down day with a 500 calorie, like you might have like just one meal at dinner, it's 500 calories. And then the next day is an unrestricted eating day. But she also has done the research, like I said, where the, you might have a full 36-hour fast. You just fast all the way. You know, you go to bed one night, wake up the next day, fast the whole day, go to bed again. The next day you wake up, it's an up day, unrestricted eating. They found in their research that on the up days, participants, they were told to be unrestricted in their eating. They tended to eat about 125% of their caloric needs on the up days. So they were slightly overeating on the up days. And they also found that that was protective of metabolic rate. So that's the alternate daily fasting approach. But again, you can have a, a approach where you do one down day a week. Like we have something in my community, a lot of people enjoy mealless Monday. So the, the Monday will be a down day and they might fast all the way through it or have the 500 calorie meal. But then the next day, Tuesday is an up day. And then maybe every other day of the week, they decide to have an eating window. Love it. Okay. It's kind of like a hybrid approach. Now, I don't do that. I like to eat every day. So I don't, <laughs> you know, I've done all of the different approaches. I've, I've tried them, experimented with them. There was a time right after the obesity code came out because he really talked about, you know, alternate daily fasting is what he had in his appendix, you know, like the skip yeah. a day. Then, but, so I was like, okay, well, that's what Jason Fung says. I'm going to try it. So I did it for a while and I'd done it before, but since that was what was in the back of the obesity code, I was like, I'm going to just really stick with it. And I did it a little while, but right around, um, I don't know, a couple months in, I was like, you know, I really just want to eat every day. So I switched over to the eating window approach and I haven't skipped a day of eating since. I've awesome. eaten every day since 2016. But some people love alternate daily fasting. But I recommend that you start with um, the daily eating window approach. And I have a plan, like I said, in Fast, Feast, Repeat, um, which I really would recommend that you just get it and read it um, if you're for someone who's wanting to know how do I get started. Because it's, you know, obviously it's more than I can just tell you in a in a one hour interview. Um, but there, I have something called the 28 Day Fast Start. And that is where you will let your body adapt to intermittent fasting. One really important thing is I don't want anyone to expect weight loss over those first 28 days, which is like the opposite of what, you know, every other diet plan will tell you, oh, mm -hmm. in the first month you're going to lose 30 pounds. No, you are not. <laughs> you might even gain a little weight because your body's like, what's happening? You might really overeat in your eating window because you're overcompensating because you're not tapping into fat stores well, because you're not adapted well. That it's very common in the beginning. But once your body adjusts, it settles down, you feel better, you're not starving in your eating window anymore. And then, you know, after you're adjusted, you can start slow and steady weight loss, maybe like a pound a week. So, I mean, it's not very sexy for me to say two months in, you might be down four pounds. But that's just the reality of it. Um, this is a slow and steady, very healthy way to live. I like to call it the health plan with a side effect of weight loss. But, you know, back to the 28-day fast start, within there, there's like a quiz you can take that will help you decide whether you're going to rip off the Band-Aid and, you know, start a little more aggressively. And then every week you'll ramp it up a little or whether you're going to really slow and steady your way through it. There's no right or wrong way. It's knowing yourself. And you can decide to start ripping off the Band-Aid and go aggressive with an eight-hour window the first week or even a five-hour window. And you're like, wait, that's too much. My body's not ready. Scale it back. I'm a big proponent of listening to your body rather than me telling you, here's the plan you have to follow. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are wise. And the more we learn to listen, we reconnect. And it's really life-changing. Yeah, totally agree. Okay. And there's something that I'm going to back up just for a little bit because you actually mentioned um, 
you know, eating slightly more on those up days versus low right. down days when we're talking about that. And what you said was it is metabolically protective. Yes. And I want to unpack that for listeners and make sure that didn't escape them. So often they'll hear the term, and I've used this too, metabolic flexibility and maintaining that being so important. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Well, those are actually two, like metabolic flexibility, the way that I was using it was talking about our body's ability to shift fuel sources as needed. Like for example, during the fast, once we're adapted, we can tap into fat stores for fuel. And then when we are in the fed state, we use our our meal as our fuel. So metabolic flexibility on that in, in that regard means your body has the ability to switch from fuel sources as needed. We're born metabolically flexible, but we lose that with our culture of um, eating, you know, six times a day and then snacks and then lattes. And then it's like, I can think back to when I was obese. I was never more than 30 minutes from putting something in my mouth, whether it was a latte, sip of a latte or a snack. I mean, honestly, it was like all day long, constant. And so I was definitely not metabolically flexible. I had to go from snack to meal to latte because I needed that constant influx of energy or I would be hangry. With fasting, we don't have that because you're tapping into your fat stores so well during the fast. Once you're adapted, your body's like, I got this. You got your fuel right there. You just go on about your day. It's easy. Then you eat later. It's just It, it just is seamless. No more hangry. All right. So that's what I meant by metabolic flexibility. As far as the metabolic boosting of the up day, there's very clear research that the more we eat, the faster our body actually upregulates our metabolism. You know, we've heard that, you know, people are overweight because they have a slow metabolism, but really a lot of times people who are overweight have a pretty fast metabolism. It's just a matter of um, that they're, they're eating more food than their body needs. That's why they're storing it. And also they're trapped in that, you know, high insulin levels all the time. So they're trapped in that fat storage mode. So um, what we what we do with fasting is we make sure that we're not lowering our metabolic rate by eating too little over time. That's important because that does happen. And it, you know, let's say we were doing alternate daily fasting and we were having, you know, a 500 calorie meal on the down day. And then the next day you only ate 1200 calories. Your body is going to get this, the, the idea, okay, we're starving. Time to downregulate our metabolism. There's not enough food coming in. So if you don't have enough fuel coming in, your body downregulates your metabolism. So when you're feeding your body well on the up days, if you're doing an alternate daily fasting approach, your body doesn't get the signal that you're starving. And that, that food, the metabolic boost day, keeps that metabolism humming along. You know, the same thing with an eating window. If someone like it's really, you know, like I'm going to just have a one hour eating window every day, you might get off to a great start, lose weight quickly. But then even with the protective, you know, the fasting is fairly protective of our metabolic rate. But if you're over restricting still within too much, you know, short window, not eating enough, your body will downregulate over time. So for me, I find I naturally gravitate to some days I eat more, some days I eat less. And I'm very responsive to the the cues that my body sends me. But, you know, it is very clear. If you eat a lot of food over a long period of time, it will raise your metabolism. So, you know, what we've heard, you know, I have to eat six small meals to get my metabolism going. That's based on truth, except that all those six small meals may make your metabolic rate go up, but not as much as the food that you ate. (laughs) Right. If that makes sense. Right. Your, your, your rate may be boosted, but it's not boosted so much that it overcomes all the fuel you just put in. Right. You're putting in too much fuel every single day all the time, you're going to gain weight. That's how it works. And there's never, ever a reason for your body to dip into fat yes, stores because it's got it up. constant availability. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Oh, Yes. Okay. I'd like to like to rip apart some bodybuilders and that kind of content, <laughs> but we won't go there. No. <laughs> I mean, even it's founded on the science, right? And, and we we just can apply it incorrectly. Oh, mm-hmm. eating eating revs my metabolism. The more I eat, the more it'll rev it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you've got to think. You know, why would we compare ourselves to? 
you know, somebody who's not doing what we're doing. And that's where I think we also get off, you know, when, when it is body, bodybuilders, figure competitors oh, yeah. who, who are telling you to do this and they're doing it to get the muscle protein synthesis regularly. Well, if you're not lifting like that, you're not, you're not otherwise eating like they're eating. Right. You have to that, decide, are you trying to build yeah. a bigger body or yeah. trying to make your body smaller? It, you know, and, which is what we do when we're losing weight. We want to change our bodies. We want to lose the fat. So eating more frequently is not a you know winning long term recipe. We all tried that, right? Yeah, so true, so true. All right, so you've had. I mean, I love the titles of your books. First Thank of you. all, I just I could geek out about that, but I think there is a you know there's clever and there's clear, and you have managed to put the best of both worlds together. So it's, it's very obvious what the book is about, but it's also somewhat clever and fun. What made you write Cleanish? You know, one funny thing happens with intermittent fasters, and it's almost universal. You know, I, I've had um, intermittent fasting support groups since 2015 when I started one just for me and my friends. And it was like me and 30 people. And then it grew and grew and grew till finally when I left Facebook, I had like almost – half a million people in my combined groups. So I left. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do this anymore. It was too much. But one thing, and with the podcast, talking to all the people and, and from the support groups, almost universally, we find that our tastes in food change the longer we do intermittent fasting. It's the weirdest thing. When I started in 2014, I ate like a teenage boy who was at the college cafeteria with mom not there watching him. You know, I was eating the standard that scares me. diet. Well, yes. I know. I was I was like, I'm going to just eat whatever I want. And I was driving through. I was a lot of ultra processed foods. That's also how I was raised. I really unpack it and cleanish. You know, my mother raised me on SpaghettiOs and TV dinners because that's what I would eat because that's what she let me eat, right? So I had like the palate really honestly of like a child. And that's not a good thing. But over time with intermittent fasting, I started to suddenly find vegetables gained more appeal. I really think a lot of it came from, you know, fasting clean and drinking black coffee during the fast with that bitter flavor profile. I swear mm -hmm. that opened up my palate so that I could tolerate, you know, Brussels sprouts and things like that. But almost universally, we find people who are doing intermittent fasting, they start to feel better and then they start to crave better foods. Then they start to eat better foods. And it's like a cycle that continues. The better you eat, the better you feel, the better you feel, the better you eat. And then all of a sudden, you realize your old favorite driving through the golden arches makes you feel awful. Like I remember one Christmas, you know, I used to be like the person who would always go to the holiday flavors at Starbucks, right? Like pumpkin spice latte or gingerbread latte. I was so excited. I remember going to Target one day, Christmas shopping and gingerbread spice was out and my eating window was open. And I'm like, I'm going to have a gingerbread latte because I can't. And I took a sip of it and I was like, why does this taste like rat poison? <laughs> Did they change what they put in it? No, my tastes had changed. Like I can no longer tolerate bottled salad dressings. They taste so fake and gross. So I just started getting interested in eating in a cleaner way. But, you know, that can send you down a slippery slope towards like orthorexia or something if you become obsessed with, you know, everything must be perfectly clean. So that's why I started describing how I, I ate as cleanish. You know, I focus on real foods, whole foods, high quality foods, but I, I don't stress out about you know, every little thing when I go out to eat, I'm cleanish. You know, I avoid, for example, cooking with certain vegetable oils that I don't think are, are good for your body. Um, like I would never use canola oil at home. But if I'm out at a restaurant and I don't ask them what their oil is like or avoid something just because, you know, I, I'm cleanish. You know, my goal is to, you know, lower my overall toxic load by putting less in when I can. I also work on, you know, eating nutritious foods because that, that also helps our body's, you know, self-cleaning mechanisms. The nutrients in the food work together with our liver, for example. And then I also really um, make sure that I am making the most of my body's self-cleaning mechanisms. Intermittent fasting is one great example of that. When we're fasting, our bodies upregulate autophagy, which is 
our body's recycling and upcycling system. And it's our body cleaning up all that cellular junk. Super important. Now, you do not have to do intermittent fasting to read Cleanish. It's not an intermittent fasting book. I had to really sell my editor on that. She's like, what's your next intermittent fasting book? I'm like, nope, it's not going to be about intermittent fasting. But there is a chapter in there about intermittent fasting because I believe it's your most powerful self-cleaning tool. But when we learn to you know, support all of our body's self-cleaning mechanisms through our food choices, our lifestyle choices, for example, I don't drink wine every day anymore because my liver doesn't, doesn't need that every day, right? You know, it keeps my liver from processing other toxins. So it, it just really, you know, you go down that path of wanting to upgrade your life naturally. And that's where getting cleanish comes in. You know, it even applies to what you put on your skin, you know, what you clean your house with, your laundry detergent. So um, all the way through cleanish, I walk the, the reader through how to decide what's important to you. Like you're going to decide these are my never things. Like you're going to create your own personal definition of cleanish eating, cleanish living. For me, art, artificial sweeteners are a never. They're a never for me. I don't like the way they taste. They're not good for our bodies in any way, shape, or form. That is something I'm never going to have, ever. But other people may decide, you know, I'm going to, every now and then I might have a diet soda because it makes me so happy. And that might be part of their definition of cleanish living, but they might make a switch somewhere else. It's just, we want to intentionally put fewer toxins into our body and then intentionally help our bodies take out the toxins that are going to get in anyway. Love it. Love it. And what I hear you saying without maybe saying it is that you've got this very practical application within the book, but I hear within how you're delivering it that you're really addressing the psychology and the motives behind and how to get to that underlying ability to to change, which is one of the hardest things that humans do. Right. I, I believe very much in empowering people to design their own change. You know, we've all bought the books that had food lists and do's and don'ts. And then eventually you're like, I am sick of this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, mean, I was a teacher for 28 years. You know, I, um, I talked about my doctorate being in gifted education. And I know that, that choice and empowering people is powerful. And, and that's how they're going to make the change. You know, I can tell you what to do all day long, but until you internalize why you're doing it and you want to do it, it's not going to make you change a thing. So I, I consider myself to be a facilitator or a teacher. So I will teach you, here are the things you need to know about, you know, what's in our foods that you may not even realize, what you're putting on your skin. And here are some things you can do to make a difference. And then you decide what's important to you. Love it. Okay, Jen, while I have you here, let's make sure our listeners know where to where to get more gin and where exactly to either pre-order or pick up the book. Well, you can pre-order anywhere that, that books are sold. You can even go to a local bookstore and ask them to pre-order it for you. I love to support local businesses. So, you know, they can order it for you. They know how to get it. It's published by St. Martin's Press, which is part of Macmillan. So it's really easy to find or easy, of course, to go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon, find it there. Um, if you're looking for me, you want to connect with me, go to jenstevens.com. Jen is G-I-N, Stevens is with a P-H, jenstevens.com. And, you know, to find out more about Cleanish, you can go to jenstevens.com slash Cleanish. I also have a community. We're going to be doing a community book study. And um, it's jenstevens.com slash community. And it's really an intermittent fasting community. And within it, you know, we support each other through intermittent fasting. It's a paid membership community, but it's it's not it's not very much at all. Um it's like really ends up being like a dollar a week if you do the, the yearly membership, which is not much to connect with other people. But we'll be having a cleanish book study that starts um, January 5th of 22. And we'll be working through it. It's not the kind of book that you sit down and you like read it from cover to cover. And then you're like, all right, I read that. Instead, you read a chapter, then you have a reflect and take action section and you sit with it for a while. And you're like, all right, what can I do differently? Then you go on to the next chapter and every bit of it is just like taking you down that path 
till you get to the end when you when you develop your definition of cleanish eating, your definition of cleanish living, and then you have your implementation time. So um, I would love to have people join us in the community if they're interested. I just love it there. It's so a very good. positive place to be. So many great resources. I love it. Love the foundation of entertainment and education together, but also finding each individual's right way to apply it. Love what you're doing. Jen, thank, you. thank you so much for being here. Well, I've really enjoyed it. Listeners, okay, so now it's your turn. So first of all, you have your assignment. You're going to either pre-order or you're going to run out and grab that book. And it'll be great content, whether you join Jin's community or you're in our Flipping 50 Insiders group on Facebook. If you're not there, listeners, it's a great place to put your podcast question. And potentially that'll be used on a Friday podcast where I do Q&As. So it's facebook.com forward slash groups flipping 50 insiders. And if you have a question that I didn't ask Jen and you wish I would have, you can put that question below the show notes today at flipping 50.com forward slash I F that's for intermittent fasting, but just I F and what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today.